In this video, we're going to talk about the relationship between cryptocurrencies and the blockchain. Because a lot of times we may see on the news, maybe it's a CEO or somebody, they come on and they say, well, we're not interested in cryptocurrencies, but we are interested in the blockchain technology. And it may not be intentional, but what the statement seems to suggest is that we could somehow disregard these cryptocurrencies and just use the blockchain tech. Or in other words, these cryptocurrencies are a fad, they're not a big deal, but what is really important is the blockchain. And that's what I want to explore in this video, okay? Can we just disregard these cryptocurrencies? Or are the cryptocurrencies an integral part of what makes a blockchain function? Okay, so let's go ahead and start by defining what a blockchain is. A blockchain is a new way of storing information where we have a history of every single change that has taken place to that information and nobody has the power to edit or delete it. So no user, no admin, nobody has the power to edit or delete that history of transactions. If you are familiar at all with Eastern philosophy and you've heard about this thing called the Akashic Records, okay, it's the perfect metaphor. Basically with the Akashic Records, the idea is, is that the universe has this perfect memory of every thought, word, action, and deed that has ever taken place in the universe. And mystics or people after they die can go and they can look back throughout these, uh, this memory in order to see how certain people got to their perspective. Okay, in other words, how did that master get so good at him? What was it? What early events in his life drove him to behave that way? Or whatever, right? So you have this accountability where you can see back and see how people got to their perspective. Okay, and that's what the blockchain is. Okay, so instead of for mystics and the universe, it's for techies and computers, right? Is we have this perfect memory of any information that uh, we want to store on there of how it got to its current state. And nobody has the power to edit or delete that information. Now you may say, okay, cool, well, how is that possible? Because on all computers, whether it's your personal computer, okay, or a server, somebody has the power to edit or delete the information that's on that. And sure, maybe on your personal computer, whoa, hit that kind of hard. On a personal computer, you have uh, maybe time machine software on your Mac where you can go back and uh, you know, recover old files. But even still, you have the ability to edit or delete that backup. In the case of a server, of course, they have backups and have it in multiple locations. But even still, somebody has the power to edit or delete that information. Okay? But with the blockchain, nobody has the power to edit or delete that information. So how is this possible? Well, the way it's achieved is through a peer-to-peer -peer network. So a copy of the information is distributed all throughout these various nodes within the network. And through incentives, okay, which is a key word, through incentives, they basically police each other to keep this information in sync. So even though an individual person who just has a computer like this even though they can edit the information, if they do, they'll just get kicked off of the network, right? So the incentives keep it in, keep it in such a way where these people keep this information in sync, okay? If somebody gets lost in a fire or flood, they just drop them from the network and the network remains. So it's through the peer-to-peer -peer network that we're able to make a blockchain possible, okay? Because it gives us that property of immutability or in other words nobody has the power to edit or delete it because no one person has control over the information it's decentralized and each individual person is operating in their own self-interest okay because they have an incentive which we're about to talk about they have an incentive to participate in this network and to do their part but in doing so by filling, fulfilling their selfish incentive it creates this emergent property that's good for everybody so, so that's the thing though, is why, why would anybody want to participate in this peer-to-peer -peer network? I mean, it's great, it's cool, we're able to do all this uh, cool blockchain stuff, but why would anybody want to be a node within this network? Well, here's where cryptocurrencies come in, okay? They get rewarded in the form 
of cryptocurrency for doing their part in securing this network. So in the case of Bitcoin, they get Bitcoin. In the case of the Ethereum network, they get Ether. So they are rewarded financially, okay? Or in other words, they're incentivized with financial rewards in order to participate in this network. They're not just doing it for fun. It's not just a hobby. It's not for free. It is because they are making money. And so not only are they making money, but they are incentivized to maximize their profit margin. So they get better at what they do. Uh, they lower their electricity costs by having you know, cleaner forms of energy or maybe um, you know, better, more efficient computers and all this kind of thing because they want to maximize how much money they're making. So if we take away this cryptocurrency, not only do we take away the reason for people to improve what they're doing, but we also take away their even reason to participate within the network. Okay? So we can't just strip out the cryptocurrency without you know, completely messing the whole thing up. So the cryptocurrency is an integral part of the blockchain. Now you may say, okay, well that's cool, but how do we do these smart contract things? How does this whole you know, other stuff besides the currency application tie in? Okay, well, let's explain that. So we're going to start with Bitcoin, and then we're going to go to Ethereum, which is where all these smart contracts and other applications are taking place. So with Bitcoin, the memory that we are storing, okay, all this information, all the changes that have taken place to it, is simply the balances of Bitcoin. Okay, in other words, it's like a checkbook. Okay, person A sent money to person B, and therefore person A has this balance, and person B has this balance, and then person B sent money to person C, and then the balance changes, right? And so this information in Bitcoin is just about money, okay? It's just about the, the changes and balances of Bitcoin. With Ethereum, they said, hey, look, how about we, you know, abstract this, we take it to a more general level, and instead of it just being about the balance of, in their case, Ether, what if we allow people to store data and edit that data. So basically, you can think of it like this, right? On your computer, you just have a bunch of zeros and ones, okay, this memory. Well, this information is a bunch of zeros and ones and all of the changes that have taken place to that set of zeros and ones, okay, all that data. So you know that this user changed this set of zeros and ones to this zeros and ones, and this zeros and ones changed to this thing like that, right? And so we can use it for all sorts of things other than just currency, okay? It could be used for, you know, car titles, home titles, stock certificates. You can use it for all sorts of things from like little things like parking, uh, reservations to movie tickets, right? There's like a million and one things that you can use this for. And so we still have the cryptocurrency though, okay? And so how does this cryptocurrency play in? Well, first of all, you could use Ethereum in the same way that you use Bitcoin, where you're just exchanging Ether. But you can also use it to create these decentralized apps. And then when you interact with one of these decentralized apps, depending on how much data you change, okay, so if you're changing just a small set of zeros and ones, you're going to just pay a little postage fee, right? But if you want to do a big change, it's going to require a lot of computation on the parts of the miners, then you're going to have to pay a larger fee. Okay? It's like going to the post office. If you wanted to send a, a letter, then put an envelope and boom, you put a stamp on it. But if you want to send a big box, you can't just put a stamp, right? You have to print out the special label and pay a little bit more. And so the same is true with Ether. So depending on how much computation you're going to be doing, you're going to have to pay in proportion to that. Okay? And so that's how the cryptocurrency fits in. Okay? And in Ethereum, you, the re, the miners are also getting that incentive in the form of Ether. So it's playing two roles. It's incentivizing people to participate, and it's also you know, paying for postage. So if people are going to do a lot of computation, they have to pay more, and if they're going to do a little bit, they pay less. So even though we're using the blockchain for all these other things, we still have to have the cryptocurrency. Okay, so hopefully that clears it up. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions or comments, leave them below and I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you for watching.